I guess um, today we're going to finish our discussion on Hume. And we left to today the stuff uh, that's on reason and the passions, which for Hume connects directly to uh, ethics. Um, and there may be other things that you want to talk about having to do with Hume's theory of the self and so on and so forth. And you may want to, you may want to make some connections that interest you. So why don't we just start, why don't we do it the same way we did last time? Why don't you, uh, ask me some questions and we'll get into a conversation. Yeah. I, you know, not being a philosopher, I know fairly little about Hume, but I am a fan based on what I know. Um, and we talked a little last time about how just clear he is. Uh, in his writing and I think in his reasoning and how uh, how nice that is. But I, there are a couple of specific uh, positions that uh, that I'm very drawn to of his. Okay. And one, uh, and I think we might as well start out with this and we'll probably spend much of the conversation on it. It's, ve it's very famous. It's As you said, it's about the reasons and the passions. We should say that passions isn't meant exactly the way it's meant today. With You know, with passions today, you think of we mainly think of sexual passion, probably. Yeah. He, he meant the emotions broadly, and I would say even further, he meant affect, affective responses to things generically. That's exactly right, yeah. And so when he says in this famous sentence, he says, he's talking about the relationship between reason and aff between cognition, you know, what is sometimes called cognition and affect, between reason and, and, and feelings or emotions. He says, reason is and ought only to be the slave of the passions and can never pretend to any other office than to serve and obey them. He's a great writer. He's a great writer. Yes. The, the, uh, but, but, but one interesting thing here is he's saying two different things. He's saying reason is the slave of, the, of, of feelings. Uh, it serves them. And he's saying and ought only to be. And I honestly... <clears throat> don't understand the ought only to be part. I don't understand what he's trying to get across here. And I'm going to turn to you later for enlightenment on that point. Okay. I, I, as for the descriptive part, reason is the slave of the passions. I think that's very consistent with what is coming out of modern psychology generally, in terms of even actual brain scan studies showing how closely affect and cognition are intertwined, but, but this is also very consistent with evolutionary psychology, just in a kind of a theoretical sense, almost. Um, it's also consistent, I should say, with my own introspection, especially when I do things like meditate. Um, and this, like, this is not the only thing that I think uh, is a little bit uh, Buddhist of, of Hume. There's been a lot of discussion, maybe we'll have time to get to this, about how his skepticism about the existence of the self is very Buddhist. But that's a separate matter. So, um, you know, I think, uh, his point is that, like, when it comes to actually motivating behavior, I think this is his point, there's got to be feelings involved, and in a way it boils down to feelings. So, like, you know, imagine anything that you're employing reason to do, like, say I'm researching some purchase, like, I decide I want... A, I need a new down jacket. Um, I research it online. I come to a conclusion. I think Hume would say that, first of all, the, chain, the, the, the reasoning begins in feeling because wanting a jacket is a feeling. It, now, it may in turn be informed by reason. You may reflect on the fact that you got colder than you'd like to be. But, of course, being cold is than you're cold than you'd like to be is a feeling. In any event, the, the desire to purchase something is a feeling. That triggers a chain of research and reasoning. But then when you ultimately, the, desi the desire to buy a specific coat is also a feeling. And it has been, in, it, sure, it has been informed by reason. So, so, so th th this little bit of reasoning has its beginning and its end in feeling, and at the end of the day, it's feeling that uh, that motivates you to buy a jacket. So, feeling tells reason what to think about, what research to do, and then in the end, I'm not sure Hume emphasized both of these things. I think modern psychology would emphasize both of these, and there are even interesting brain scan studies about uh, purchasing decisions. Well, they do the brain scans on people, and they find they can predict pretty well 
what they're going to buy by just looking at the affective parts of the brain, you know, whether they're, they're the, 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 the kind of approach and avoidance parts of the brain, you might say. Um, so anyway, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly how much emphasis Hume puts on these two aspects, the, the fact that, that feelings tell you what to reason about, and then at the other end, that the reelings are kind of, the reasoning is kind of cashed out in the way of feeling, which then finally motivates the behavior. But, uh, so, but I would say it's very consistent with modern psychology, and I, I can elaborate later uh, maybe on why I say it's, this is very much a, an evolutionarily psychological view as well. It's very consistent with modern ev psych in a theoretical sense, but, but first, why don't you uh, react to what I've said? Um, so the stuff about reason and the passions um, actually comes out of out of um, um, is is bundled together with other elements in which Hume is criticizing kind of rationalist morality um, or reason based morality, um, and so because we're going to discuss these separately, and you haven't m mentioned morality yet, I'm just going to separate this part of the of the mm -hmm. critique out. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons why he thinks that that um, that uh, 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 rationalist or reason based morality is faulty is precisely because reason he thinks doesn't move anything, right? Um, and um, all that reason can do is is lead to a belief that such and such is the case. Right. right? So the example that you gave with the code is a perfect example, right? So I might, um, on the basis of a scientific investigation, find out that a human being's body temperature needs to be kept at a certain uh, at a certain uh, uh, temperature, um, and that therefore, if the external temperature falls below a certain point then a human being, as a matter of fact, um, needs a coat, right? But unless I care about remaining warm or even about surviving, that belief in by itself is not going to lead me to do anything, right? It's causally inert in the sense of, uh, and, and Hume thinks this about all matters of what he calls the understanding. That which belongs to the understanding um, um, has to do with what is true and false, Right. But it does not, in and of itself, move us to do anything. Right. Now, the way this connects to ethics is because ethics, Hume thinks, is a fundamentally practical discipline. At the end of the day, it's supposed to be about why we do things. Mm -hmm. right? um, and, and, and about wanting one thing to happen. Right, that's right. That's, that's what right. prescription is. That's when right. you say that's you right. should do this. That's right. And it's worth mentioning that you know Kant, who is very much... A rationalist about morality who very much thinks that morality uh, is a result of reason is the product of reason has a notoriously terribly difficult time explaining why anyone should be moral right um, um, Kant can tell give you the categorical imperative um, but as uh, Philip of foot pointed out in a very famous paper called morality is a system of hypothetical imperatives she said unless one cared about being moral there's no reason to follow the categorical imperative. In other words, it doesn't carry within it its own force, right? right. All the force, all the normative force comes from the emotions, from right. caring about these things, from things mattering to you, right? right. Um, and so I, I think, you know, this is, this is Hume's primary point here. And let me just say one last thing about it. In this sense, Hume, like a number of other modern philosophers, has a much narrower conception of reason than the ancient Greeks did. The ancient Greeks thought that reason was the much larger thing. It wasn't simply a calculating or an investigative modality. It was a way to sort of, it was a modality by which one could apprehend not just the ultimate nature of things, but the ultimate good of things. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so um, um, an ancient philosopher would never accept the separation of the of, of of the separation between reason and emotion the way that Hume does, um, but that's simply a result of Hume being so influenced by the modern scientific revolution, right? And by and by and by and by uh, and by a picture of of the world in which reason has a much smaller and more instrument more purely instrumental role uh, in our lives. Mm -hmm.